Baptist Church. And uh, it's been part of the original plan since they built the church back in 1985. And they're finally going to build that multi-purpose building. So I got the email this week because they had to do a geological report. And we've been waiting three months for the geological report. And you can imagine that when I got the email and saw that it was 29 pages, I had to decide when I was going to read it. So I decided that I was going to read all 29 pages. Don't you think I should read all 29? Now, I'm not sure how many people on the building committee that meets tomorrow will read all 29 pages, but I think they're counting that the pastor is going to read all 29 pages. Well, as I was reading along, something caught my attention. It was on page 8. You realize 21 more pages to go. But on page 8, they said, we see no problems why this building cannot be built. And I thought, why 21 more pages? And so I read the net, next page, page 9. And we will discuss page 9 tomorrow. Because it says, although we see no problems with this building, when we went down 12 feet, we found water. Barbara, only 12 feet down, they found water at the Fremont Church. How many people with wells would love to have only a 12-foot well? I remember when I lived in Mariposa, if you were less than 200 feet, they considered that a good well. And I'm thinking, 200 feet? And that's only two gallons a minute. <gasps> Not a good well. So I said, I better keep reading. And they said, because of the water being only 12 feet down, and by the way, if you can do some simple math, two-tenths of a kilometer away from the Fremont Church, does anyone know what it is? Yeah, what fault? The Calaveras Fault! Two-tenths of a kilometer. Do you know how far that is? It's not far at all, is it? You can run that pretty quick, can't you? Two-tenths of a kilometer. So I said, I better keep reading. And they said, well, what we have to do, we can't build the building on that site because 12 feet down is water. Now you realize if they put that on there, what's going to happen? Look, look at what's happening today. They said, however, we have all this building material that we can put in there to make sure that the building will not shift. And so therefore, we see no problems with putting up the building. But they went through 21 pages of telling all the material. Now you realize I'm looking at the material there because this is going to be our building, right? And you can imagine that it's not sand, it's not dirt. What is it? They're putting in some heavy-duty rock there. Okay, so obviously this is what they're proposing to the city of Fremont. But I noticed that they kept saying rock. Why? Is rock a safe place to build? One of the stories that Cadiz likes because it has a song to it is the one that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 7, verses 20 to the end of the chapter. Now, you all know that. What did Jesus say? He said, the wise man does what? Builds his house on the sand. You mean all these people that build those houses on the coast of California and love having it on the sand, what happens to them? Now, some of you were here when we really had the end of the drought and the rains came. Who remembers back in 1992? I'm sorry, 1982? Thank you. 1982? We lived in Santa Cruz. And some of you may know, right on the edge of the cliff in Santa Cruz is O'Neill's house. You know who O'Neill is? Everyone knows O'Neill, right? He's the one who makes all the surfing clothes and everything. And he had a beautiful cedar there. You know the cedars. People love seeing them all along the coast. 
And I can remember it kept raining and raining, and every day we would see that that dirt going away. And finally, you could see that cedar. It was hanging on there. If you go to O'Neill's house now, the cedar is not there, OK? Because guess what? It wasn't founded on a rock, was it? It was on dirt. It was on sand. What did Jesus say? You all know the story. What happened? Cadiz knows the song, too. Do you guys know the song, too? The wise man built his house upon the? And when the storms came, what happened? But what about the foolish man? But you know, everyone knows the song and the story. But do you know why he was a wise man and why he was a foolish man? Why? Was it only that he had built his house on the rock? What made him wise? What made the man foolish? Here it is. It says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, he is a wise man. And the foolish man does what? He doesn't listen to those words. In life, everything we do is building either a stronger building, a stronger character, a stronger life, or we're foolish. And Daniel chapter 2 is about building materials. Some of you have known me a while and know that of all the chapters in the Bible, I tell you this all the time, Daniel 2, to me, Rudy, is one of the important chapters in all the Scripture. Rudy and I talked about this, and uh, Malcolm, I think you were there, part of the conversation, because there's something in Daniel 2. And you know, Rudy, I went back and studied that, and it was exactly what Malcolm and I were saying, and we're going to talk about that today. Because Daniel 2 is an important chapter, because not only is it a window into the future for God's people, but it's a window into God's coming to set up his own kingdom that will last forever. It says here in chapter 2, starting in verse 1, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, for those who like dates, it's the year 602, his mind was troubled and he could not sleep. What happens if you can't sleep and your mind's troubled? What do you do? Anybody? How many here pray? How many here get up and get something to eat? Okay, I'm just going to tell you, chances are if you get up something to eat, not going to not going to stop the troubled mind, okay? You're going to have a troubled stomach, okay? He couldn't sleep. He was troubled. But the reason he was troubled in his sleep is he had a dream. Now, have you ever been troubled by a dream? I mean, it just bothered you. Or have you ever had the dream that you woke up and you wanted to go back to the dream? Can't get it back, can you? It's gone, okay? Or have you ever got up and said, I know I dreamed something, but I can't remember what the dream is. But it seemed like it was a good dream. Well, we know in the last days, Rudy, it says the old men will dream dreams. The young men will see visions, okay? And Nebuchadnezzar dreamed a dream. And it says here that he actually forgot his dream. And so he called in all of his wise men. And it says here the astrologers answered him. The great thing about Daniel chapter 2, verse 4, through chapter 7, is the rest of Daniel, that section is all written in Aramaic. It's not written in Hebrew. It's not written in Greek although it was translated. Now, the reason that's important, and I'm telling it you today, is because it's an old language, and because of that, we can date that section of Daniel to say it was an old manuscript, not an early manuscript. So it's important that it's written in that, and it says here the astrologers spoke to him in Aramaic. Now, remember, the astrologers say, tell us the dream, 
We can pinpoint it in the stars and we can interpret it for you on the basis of the stars. And remember, the magicians would do what? Tell us what the dream is, we'll cut open a calf, we'll look inside his liver, depending on what we see in there, we can interpret it. Okay? And so they all told him, you got to tell us the dream first. And Nebuchadnezzar says to them, verse 5, if you do not tell me the dream and interpret it, I will cut you into pieces and your houses will be turned into a pile of rubble. But if you tell me the dream, I will give you great rewards. How do you like that? Sound good? Would you make something up? How many here would make something up? Or would you be like them and be so afraid that guess what? I'm not going to say anything. Is it better not to say anything than to speak? I think that's a proverb, isn't it? Isn't it a proverb? It says what? You, you guys know it, don't you? Have you ever tried to talk your way out of it and you knew that it'd be better just to shut up and everything would work out well? Well, I have to tell on my daughter. You know, I always tell on my daughter. She's becoming a negotiator with mom and dad at her young age. I mean, big time negotiator. She debates with us. And of course, She's getting a little bit more spankings now, okay? Now she's smiling and she's, she's nodding her head. Yes, she knows, okay. There's a time to negotiate and a time to be silent. These men were wise men. They knew it'd be better not to make something up and suffer the consequences. But as it says here, let the king tell the servants the dream, and we will interpret it. And the king says, you guys are just gaining time. Notice verse 9. If you do not tell me the dream, there's just one thing for you. So the astrologers, I love verse 10. And if you do have your Bible marked, in my Bible, 10 is always marked. Because it says here, the astrologers answered the king, there is no man on earth who can do what the king asks. Is there? There's no man. Can, can Daniel? Daniel's a man on earth. Can Daniel do it? You know, Daniel answers that question. He says, actually what? There's no man that can interpret it, not even me. So there is no man. Is God the author of all dreams? Is God the author of all dreams? Can the devil give you dreams? Can your neighbor give you dreams? Can your boss at work give you dreams? Okay, thank you very much. Is a nightmare a dream? That's what we're talking about. I didn't say spouse. Okay, I didn't say that. Okay. God isn't the author of all dreams, is he? Is every dream from God? No, sometimes it's the pizza you ate the night before. I can remember, I have to tell you as a kid, my mom used to tell us some of the weirdest stuff. And you know, even my brother, my two brothers and sisters, they all know, because we'll talk to mom now. And we'll say, Mom, do you remember you told us that if we ate the crust on the bread, we would have curly hair? Now you see my hair's pretty straight, okay? So you know who did not eat the crust of the bread, right? Okay? My mom used to say to us, if you eat cheese before you go to bed, you're going to dream tonight. That's what my mom would say, so guess what? We would not. But if we wanted the dream, we'd eat cheese. Not a foolproof plan. Even the astrologer said, nobody, Nebuchadnezzar, can do what you say. Nobody. Nobody can interpret the dream. 
no man on earth, because they want him to tell the dream and tell what it means. This made the king so angry that he issued a decree that all the wise men in Babylon would be put to death. And the men sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. What did Daniel have to do with this? And it says here, verse, 20, uh, verse 14, Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone to put to death the wise men of Babylon. Daniel spoke to him and said, Why did the king issue such a harsh decree? And he explained to him the matter, and at this, Daniel went into the king to ask for time so that he might interpret the dream. Would you do that? What gave Daniel the right to say, hey, tell the king, give me some time, and I'll give him the interpretation of the dream? What gave Daniel the faith to say that? What? How did Daniel know that God would give him the interpretation of the dream? Would you have the same faith? Daniel wasn't the only one there. Remember, there's Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or you might know them as. There was other Jews there. Why is Daniel stepping forward and saying, wait a minute? You have to ask that question. You have to ask, why? Why would Daniel step forward? Wait a minute. What's Daniel's history? Do you think Daniel knew of a story from the Bible? Wait a minute. Wasn't someone taken captive against his will and ended up in Egypt? And then wasn't he thrown in jail? And didn't he interpret the dream for the cupbearer of the king and the baker? And when the king had a dream, he called in uh, Joseph, and Joseph interpreted it? Isn't Daniel in the same situation? Daniel believes that God is speaking to Nebuchadnezzar as God spoke to Pharaoh. Who knows? Will you allow me to quote the verse? Who knows if the reason Daniel was in Babylon is to get this message to God's people? Not only that, who knows? if Daniel's in Babylon to save Nebuchadnezzar. Would God have given the dream if there was nobody there to interpret it? Daniel says, God has a message because, why? I'm here in Babylon. So it says here, what's the first thing they did? What's the first thing they did? You have trouble? Please, pray, pray. God still uses it as an avenue of communication. And it says, Daniel returned to his house and he explained the matter. Notice their names are not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He went to his friends, Hananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah, and he said, let's plead to God that he will reveal the mystery to us. Do you catch what it says? Daniel doesn't get his three friends and say, let's pray to God and ask him to give me the dream. Do you hear the difference? He's not praying for himself. What's he praying for? Who do you think Daniel's praying for? Would you love to hear that prayer? You know, Daniel did record his prayer in Daniel chapter 9. So we know chances are how Daniel began his prayer. How do you think he began his prayer? 
Lord, you brought us here to Babylon for such a time as this, and I'm your great spokesman, so go ahead and give me the dream. How many think that's the way Daniel prayed? What do you think he said? Father, I'm a great sinner. We're here in Babylon because of our sin. Read chapter 9. 9, there's no difference between the prayer in 2 and the prayer in 9. He said, God, be merciful to us. We're here. If this time has come for us to die, let it happen. But if you're speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, he needs to know that there is a God in heaven. And what does it say? Did you ever catch what happens here with Daniel? It says, during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel. In a vision. Wait a minute. Did you guys hear that? They were in prayer. What happened in prayer? Did they fall asleep in prayer? Had they reached a place in prayer where they said, God has heard us. Let's see what he says. That's how long you're supposed to pray. You're supposed to reach the place in prayer where you say, I've said everything I ha I've need to say. I'm going to now leave it with God. He's heard me. Because Daniel's sleeping. He wasn't troubled. Notice the difference, the contrast between Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was troubled in his sleep. Daniel went to sleep. He was at peace. If Daniel died, he died. If God gave him the interpretation, he'd give it to him or Hananiah, Mishael, or Azariah. It says, in the night, God gave him the vision. So what happened? Daniel rolled over, put the alarm on snooze, and waited for sunlight, right? What did he do? Immediately, here it is, Rudy. Now, do you guys know that on a poster in the fellowship hall, how many knows that this verse is there? Who put it up? Did somebody in our church put it up, or did, some, did it just appear one day? Do you know Daniel chapter 2, verse, do you know it's there? Somebody put it up. It wasn't there last week, when I, two weeks ago when I came. Somebody put it up. Thank you for putting it up. Here's what it says. Praise be the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are His. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and deposes them. And He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. There it is, Rudy. We had a discussion, didn't we, Malcolm? Does God raise up all kings and sets down all kings? Does it say that? It does not say that. Does it? Does it, Rudy? doesn't say he sets up all kings and pulls down all kings, does it? doesn't say all. What does it say? He can do it. Can God set up kings and put them down? Yes, he can. Does he do it all the time? No, he doesn't. Listen to what the verse says. He doesn't set up all kings. He doesn't pull down all kings. Can he? That's what he says here. God can put up all kings. God can bring down kings. Can he? A great example of this, if we just want to stay in Scripture, is look at Isaiah. Chapter 38 and 39. What happened? Sennacherib comes to Jerusalem and what happens? He has 186,000 soldiers. He surrounds Jerusalem. He sends a message to Hezekiah. And what does Hezekiah do? Does anyone here know what Hezekiah does? He opens that letter, and he reads that letter to God. Have you ever read a letter to God? 
He read that letter to God. And what did he say? He said, God, they're speaking against you. We know that you can get rid of Sennacherib. And what happens? Does anyone know what happened that night? It says, the angel of the Lord went out to the camp and killed 186,000 soldiers. That quick? How many firstborn in Egypt to God? Can God raise up kings? Yes. Can he take them down? Yes. Does he do it to everybody? All Daniel says is praise be to God because he can change times and seasons. And he reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what's in darkness. He has given me wisdom. He has made me to know what dream the king had. Isn't it amazing that Nebuchadnezzar sent out a death decree to wipe out all the wise men in Babylon, and now one of the captives says, give me some time. All the wise men were spared. It shows that what, can we say this about Nebuchadnezzar? He gave them a threat, didn't he? He didn't really want to kill all the wise men, did he? No, or he would have never gave Daniel time. And so it says, verse 24, Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon. Do not execute the wise men. Take me to the king. I will interpret the dream. So Daniel appeared before the king, and notice they had to call him Belteshazzar. He asked him, are you able to interpret the dream? Verse 27 should go with verse 10. No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain the king the mystery, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he's made known to Nebuchadnezzar and everyone else who will listen what will happen. Did you catch that? There is a God in heaven. He's not on earth. Nebuchadnezzar thought God's dwelt among men. It's God in heaven, and he has revealed to Nebuchadnezzar. You know the dream? Do you like the dream? Does everyone know it? What did he see? He saw an image. You realize the word there is the word icon. Okay, what's the word icon? Image. Statue. He saw an image. And... What did it look like? What was the head of gold? And what followed the head of gold? Arms and breasts of? Belly and thighs of? Legs of? Feet of? Iron and clay, which we call what? Concrete, right? Rebar, put on the clay, and what do you have? Concrete? Okay, you understand? We live in an age where concretes... Do you remember a few years ago when they shored up all the freeways with new concrete? Think it'll hold? You drive over them every day. Some of you in the East Bay, you'll remember when everyone loved that double-decker freeway. No one ever thought it would fall. We all remember, even the one in San Francisco, the high, the, what did they used to call it? The one in San Francisco, the, the 280 where it came over? They used to have a name for it. Everyone's forgotten. The Skyway. Concrete. What do you think of the image? What do you think of the statue? Isn't it amazing that God would choose an image to get across his message? What's the great thing about the image? What about the metals? Why isn't gold on the bottom? What would happen if gold were the feet? It wouldn't hold, would it? Gold wouldn't hold the iron and the brass and everything. So it starts with metals that are softer, and it goes to iron, which is harder. 
Okay? So they increase in strength, but decrease in what? Value. So we consider Nebuchadnezzar to be a very wealthy kingdom. We know that he put up the Hanging Gardens and the Ishtar Gate and all those things. Bridget, when you were in Germany, did you see the Ishtar Gate? You didn't go and see it? And if you ever want to see it, it's in Germany. Okay? Uh, somehow the Germans got it. I don't know how they got it, but uh, that's where the Ishtar Gate is. Uh, they took it from uh, Babylon. And it was blue in color. It had the um, cherubim on there. If you ever want to know what a cherubim is, look up the Ishtar Gate. You'll see what a cherubim looks like. But here it says there was something else about. Did I skip something on the image? Because I think that's all Nebuchadnezzar wanted to see, what the image was like. But something else happened. What happened? There was something else? In fact, it says here what? In verse 30. Uh, yeah, verse 34. It says what? As you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. So what does that mean, not by human hands? Rock was cut out. Have you ever seen the video of this? Anybody here ever seen the video that was made of this? Yeah. The rock pops out, okay? Because it doesn't say it's human hands. See, without human hands, so it pops out of the... Uh, of the mountain, and it does what? It says it does what? Smashes the image, the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold into pieces, and they became like chaff. What's chaff? What's chaff? Anybody here know what chaff is? Yeah. These are the, these are the husks that come off the wheat. And if you picture it, you throw them in the air, and what happens? The wind just takes them away, and the grain falls. The chaff, and it says what? But the rock, what? Became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, think about it. Can a rock break iron? Didn't we talk about this before? Because Cadiz was learning the thing about rock, scissor, and paper. Now she said, Daddy, which is, the, which is the strongest? And I said, the rock. She said, no, I was doing it, and someone said, paper covers rock. And I said, paper's not stronger than rock. I said, rock is strongest. Rock can break scissor. Rock can break paper, can it? Uh, am I right? But why do they say the, the paper? No. Rock baked paper. Do you understand? I guess I don't understand the game, right? Am I, am I, what type of paper is it? Cardboard. Rock still breaks cardboard, doesn't it? Okay, scissors may not cut cardboard. Okay. But think about it. Can a rock break iron? And grind it to powder? Can a rock break gold? Can a rock break silver? Can a rock break brass? Can a rock break concrete? There's something about this rock that's different. It came out of the mountain not by hands. They didn't mine this rock. You understand? It's, not, it's a different rock. Because what happens to this rock? It says it fills the whole earth. Now, does that mean the earth is rocky? What does it mean? That God is setting up a kingdom that will never be destroyed? Jesus gave the illusion to this in Matthew chapter 24. And so what does it say? Now you want the interpretation. You, O king, are a king of kings, and the God of heaven has what? Giving you dominion and power and might and glory. You are the king. You are the head of gold. After you will come an inferior kingdom of silver, followed by a kingdom of brass, 
And if you look at history, those of you who have spent time with history will know that after Babylon came Medo-Persia, and after Medo-Persia came Greece, and after Greece came Rome. And remember, the dates are all debatable. I won't give you the dates today, but um, Rome was the last world ruling empire. Rome became a divided nation into ten, and then pretty much splintered, and really the U.S. is basically a combination of all the nations. We would be a concrete uh, nation made up of uh, uh, Europe as well as everywhere else in the world. And it says in verse 44, in the days of those kings, the ten toes, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to other people. It will be crushed. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it itself will endure forever. This is the meaning of the rock, cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver and the gold into pieces. The great God has shown Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. How many believe the dream? Is it true? Has it happened? Has it all happened and taken place just like God said? So, would you say that four-fifths of the dream is filled? Are you sure? Can we be certain that the rest of it's going to be fulfilled? That God is going to set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed? It will be not ruled, it will not be ruled by people. What type of material is God using for building? Anybody here know? What type of material is God using for building? Rock? I want to tell you, today God's using clay. Would God really use clay? Wait a minute. What does it say in the beginning? God did what? Of? Yeah, the word is actually clay. He formed him of the clay. Wait a minute. What did Peter say? Does anyone here read Peter anymore? I know next year people are going to read Peter. Okay. What does Peter say? Does anyone know what 1 Peter chapter 2 says? Does anyone know? 1 Peter chapter 2. Are you there already? You are built up as what? Lively stones. What's a lively stone? Can a stone be alive? You remember a few years ago when you could buy a pet stone, pet rock, I'm sorry? You could name it and carry it with you? I often wondered, should people carry stones with them? What does Peter say? Your lively stones built up to form a spiritual kingdom. What material are we? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul talking to the church at Corinth. A church at Corinth that we would actually call them a wooden church. I remember when I was a kid, it was exactly 50 years ago. Man, it puts me young, doesn't it? I was a teenager. We moved to the east side of town from the south side. And it was my mom's first house she bought. And in the back they had a shed that was in need of repair. And us kids decided that we were going to try to repair it. Now I still remember because my mom, I'm going to tell you how much my mom earned in 1966. My aunt mom was making 35 cents an hour, Rudy, is how much my aunt mom earned. So we realized that maybe buying building material 
may be an impossible task for kids. Although, can I tell you this? Bottles back then were a nickel to return. I don't think they've changed much. Isn't it still about a nickel? And we decided collecting bottles may not get us our wooden time because we wanted to build up this, we called it the shed. So we decided what we were going to do is go to building sites and pick up the wood that they were throwing away to build this shed. Sound reasonable to you? I can remember some of the wood was so bad, but we, we collected it. Some of it had cement stuck on it, you understand? Some of it was painted white, some of it was painted other colors, orange, you know, for warning. And we got all this wood, and we decided as kids we were going to put this thing together. I remember we had rusty nails that we had picked up and so forth. Well, we got this shed together. And you know what? It didn't look too bad, you understand? As kids, you know, you look at something like that, and of course my mom let us do it. We were teenagers, and we used it as a clubhouse. Do you know that first snow came? Now, in upstate New York, snow is real snow, you know, and this isn't rain, okay? When it rains there, the streets would be flooded, and that's just regular rain. You know, we would walk with and the rain would be up there. And when the snow comes, it'll get 30 inches overnight. And that was in 66. And some of you might remember it was 68 when overnight we got 50 inches of snow. I know because we went out and shoveled, earned, earned the money. Not for the shed, though. Okay. Because I was 15 then, you know. The shed survived. In spite of those odd-looking planks, in spite of the paint and the cement still on there, for some reason that shed, it survived. In fact, that shed survived two more years. But to this day, we don't know what happened. But somebody lit it on fire, and it burned. It survived the rain. It survived the snow, it survived the wind, but it could not survive the fire. Because you see, if the building material is all wood, what's going to happen in fire? We talked about it. We said maybe we should have used brick. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians, first, uh, starting in verse 10. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder. And someone else is building on it, but each one should be careful how he builds. Paul says he's an expert builder. Now, we know he's a tent maker, okay? And I imagine tents that Paul made were pretty good tents. It says here, Paul says, I laid a foundation. And it was a good foundation. It was in Jesus Christ. And that's what he's going to say here. He says, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that already laid, which is Christ Jesus. If any man builds on the foundation... Wait a minute. Listen to these words. Can I, can I read it slowly? Tell me if you've heard these already today. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown on the day of judgment. Wait a minute. This statue was the, how do you say it? It was the apple of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's eye. He went and rewarded Daniel. He made him chief. He exalted his three friends. He praised the God of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But you can't build a kingdom on gold. In fact, you can't even build one on wood and silver. Why, Paul's, why is Paul telling us this? What does it have to do with Daniel's statue? That statue fell. The statue didn't live forever. 
the rock that was cut out of the mountain without hands. It filled the earth. It was forever. Building with gold and silver and brass and iron and concrete will not survive. In fact, Paul adds here hay and straw. Why? I think Paul is thinking about the slaves in Egypt. That's what they use to make their bricks. Bricks aren't going to survive. What building material are we using today? What materials are we trying to make of our life? The old adage, you are what you eat, is true. And it's time that determines how our health will be. But really, what we're using as building materials, Paul is saying, in the day of judgment, in the day of trying, it's going to determine what we were using. Were we using rock? Were we using gold? Remember, it says in Hosea what? People in those days will be throwing what? Their gold and their silver to who? The bats. What are the bats going to do with gold and silver? Have you ever asked that question? Why? It's useless. You can't buy your way into heaven. You can't even build your way into heaven. Did you know that? And that's why Jesus says the wise man is the one who hears my words and puts them into practice. It doesn't matter if you're building on a rock. But if you are building on the rock, not Peter. Peter's not the rock, okay? Jesus is the rock on which his church is built. Paul says, if you're using we hay and straw and stubble and all that stuff to build on, guess what's going to happen? It's not going to survive the flames. It says it will be revealed in the day of judgment what the quality of each man's work was. You notice those two houses, the wise man and the foolish man, they probably looked the same. But it wasn't until the floods came that determined who was the wise and who was the foolish. Today, those who are wise are those who put their confidence, who put their building on the rock that's cut out of the mountain of our hands. Today, God wants us to choose Him as our building material. Because on Jesus, even though it says He's the stone which the builders rejected, He's become the head of the corner. And on whomsoever He falls, he does what? Crushes. But whoever falls on him will be what? Broken. God wants to break us all today so that he can remake us. So that when the trials come, we're not like the image that's crushed to powder, but we're like the wise man who builds his house on the rock that cannot be destroyed. Let us pray. Father, we have the image of Daniel 2, one of the greatest prophecies in the Bible that lets us know that you knew what was going to happen with the rising and the fall of each of those kingdoms. And yes, Lord, we know that even in Daniel, they predicted when Jesus himself would suffer and die on the cross. But Father, today, we're here 2016 ready to go into 2017 and we need to be building on material that will survive we don't know what the future holds for us Lord we don't know what 2017 holds but one thing we know Lord is we're ready to fall on the rock and be broken so that we can be built so that we can hear the words of Jesus not like the statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw that was crushed to powder but that we be built up and be a part of that kingdom that fills the whole earth. 
Father, as your kingdom spreads today, may it spread in each of our lives is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.